However, we have Martin Zobel uh, Peter Farfrader, and Stephen Brown. So, hello everyone. Uh, we're walking over and introduced us, Martin, Stephen, and me. Welcome to our first ever DSA talk of whatever kind of communication at a web conf. Uh, well, we have almost the entire DSA team here, only a little is missing, and he's probably somewhere to say Canada. So, yeah, probably about setting up another machine. Um, well, there are a few more members we would like to thank very much for their years of service. There's Phil Hans, Ryan Murray, Joey Schulte, and James Drew. They've all done a great job over the years, but now the new team has taken over. Hi, so I'm, I'm guessing most of you know this sort of thing we do, but just really quickly, we try to look after infrastructure for various teams and that sort of thing, whether this is making sure they have the software on a machine that they need, or making sure that they have a dedicated machine to their resources. Um, we look at their various services for Debian, things like email, storage rooms, filtration rooms. We look at their, the infrastructure around the accounts that the BW or can be associated, all that stuff. We look at their a pretty reasonable amount of hardware, something like 90 machines spread across an unfortunate 30 odd locations. And we do all the usual routine work of security upgrades and all that lockdown if there's problems, that sort of thing. We use a few tools to make our job easier. At the moment, we're using Puppet, although suggestions for something that doesn't suck quite so badly wouldn't go miss. Um, we, most of our configuration and management tools are done with various Git repositories. They're mostly on DBW or under slash Git, and ones that aren't are usually mirror, mirror to Git Debian or under the mirror subdirector, so you can clone whatever you want and kind of play with the way we do things. We're trying to keep everything that isn't essential to be secret public to people that have they want. Um, we use UDLDAP, which is our own very special user management tool for driving all that based accounts. Um, Munit and Nagios for monitoring and statistical data, and we look we use an RT instance to track incoming requests and that sort of thing. And there's where you can contact us. Um, we'd also we'd just like to talk to you people today, actually hopefully get some idea of what you want. And yeah, that'll do. <laughs> just very simply, where is the RT? RTWR. RTWR. Yeah, so this is a ball for the talk. Are there any questions you'd like to ask DSA? What can we do for you? Any implementation? Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, there used to be a uh, lot of statistics for the websites that were published. Uh, it appears that the current websites don't seem to be published anymore. Um, is it by design or just happen that to be published anymore? I would look really aware if we ever did web statistics, but if you think that kind of thing is useful, we could probably help the web guys set it up again. It might become, or it might be more difficult nowadays since dot 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 debit or is distributed over four machines or so that do GeoDNS. So but depending on where in the world you are, you get a different server. But if the web people are or want statistics, we can help them set it up. What's Puppet and why does it suck? <laughs> it's a distributed configuration management tool written in Ruby that, uh, yeah, we can stop right there. 
but um, things like diffing a file is done over XML RPC over HTTPS. So it's a bit tediously slow, and it occasionally goes wrong.
looking to purple. That doesn't really help you, of course, if you just want to do something interactively, just one time. So maybe the answer there is to forward your agent, but have it prescripted so that it always asks for information whenever you're using a key. So now that um, passwords are going to be used for logging, are there other plans for doing LDAP for other services like verification of RT, for example? Not, not on my part. Um, Unfortunately, you can still use your own that password to log into LDAP. Um, and so I worked out a way around that. I'd like to leave your LDAP password as something that will use for that. Uh, but of course, if you have a service that needs password based on authentication for something else, we could probably add up with the LDAP once more so that people can add an additional set of passwords for different services. We mm -hmm. already have that for using Zulu on all, all of our virtual machines, but extending it for other things might be possible. As far as web services go, do we have an ID provider that can authenticate you as a debit card? No. Will we? <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Would you mind it's on this? It's on I'm not sure I like security properties of open ID. So <laughs> if you could somehow ensure that it's never used for anything really important, then maybe. But these things tend to creep into ever more important things. So maybe, hopefully not. What we had considered at one point was uh, setting up a Kerberos. Kerberos domain for Debian org and maybe we could use Kerberos authentication to log into web services, but I haven't recently tried how much that sucks in some browsers in today's LLAP. How does LLAP source to? Well, if people really want to set up passwords for every single service, we could route that via LLAP, but having something that doesn't require that amount of work for every user would actually be very nice if we something that we could do client certificates maybe on the other somebody else also did it need not be DSA Probably the thing that goes that has the biggest potential to go wrong is all the mirror stuff on Merkle, because it depends so much on chance to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the archive mirror, the database mirrors. Okay, for somebody new to this, can do you have a diagram of your network? that we can actually see what the hell is going on. Well, we have what is in Nigis. Nigis has all the dependencies for this host is the parent for that host. So that gives you at least the network or a, a course network layout thing. Oh, we could. Everybody can get Nagus Devon org, and if it's asking for a password or in the username, just use DSA guest with a dash as the username and any password of your choice as a password. Yeah. 
It's whatever you want. Anything from nothing? To uh, you can also use no password at all, but then Firefox will not remember it. So this is... Well, it doesn't fit completely, but that's what we have. So, uh, the, the center is Spore, it's our Nagios machine, and then we have the various routers that present one location, and for instance, you, at the bottom right you see a GW Manda, which is the gateway in, at some place in Germany, and there we have several machines behind that. But it's as good as information we have in the graphical form and it doesn't really show any service dependencies or that kind of thing. Yeah, of service dependencies we usually find out if something breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Would therefore mapping the system be a good idea? Sorry? Would mapping out what's running where be a damn good start? Well, uh, we do have some form of, inf of information what is running where, because Nagios keeps track of various services. It's just that we don't have any service dependency information anywhere. And I'm not sure mapping this is worth the effort. It might be. If somebody wants to do it, please feel free. Nagios config is on, on Git, so just pull it and get that worked out. Well, actually, what would be asked for is more than Nagos configuration. It's be documenting our applications to say, well, we operate the applications, FTP services, which has the following dependencies, the following interlinks, offers the following interfaces. If someone wants to do that, that's a very tedious work. I, can, I know that. Yes. But that would be very valuable, of course, for Debian. The big problem, of course, is doing that once is interesting. Doing it continuously becomes useful. You, you and <laughs> doing it once is, is, is hard. Keeping it up continuously is very, very hard unless it's well automated. And most of the services are actually run by various teams and not by us ourselves. <laughs> Good luck with that. I know how hard it is in the work environment. DNC. <laughs> Does it work for you? Yeah. Works the same authentication password works from Munin as well. What what we would be interested in is how what what would you like to have uh, changed from the current mail setup that we do have for the Debian org domain. Um, we had some kind of internal discussions recently uh, if we might restrict sending mail only from some certain hosts. Um, when we moved uh, Gluck Debian org to some other hosting recently, we had the problem that we were mostly setting up a service only provided to four or five Debian developers, but they were really hard depending on that, which produced more man hours for the DSA team than it might be worth doing so. Yeah. Maybe Steve can, he's doing most of the mail stuff. Perhaps he can say a bit more about that. The particular thing we ran across with Gluck was um, we provide a method of spooling and picking up your mail on some Debian machine called BSMTP, where Action will write some file that you can then pipe into your MTA later. There are exactly four users of this service, and they all had it pointed at Gluck. So when we were getting ready to turn Gluck off, we asked what seemed like a sensible question. Does anybody actually use this anymore? Could we just stop offering it? And <laughs> It was um, a warm discussion, so we're still <laughs> offering the service. Um, but we have quite a lot of other bits in our mail system in particular that feel like we're doing an awful lot of processing of mail and a reasonable amount of admin overhead maintaining these services for less than 10 users of each. Uh, you know, we have some fairly gross hackery around QMail style dot forward files. Um, 
and various other small things like this. I'd like to, one of the things we want to do at some point is uncouple at Debian.org and at master Debian.org because, you know, master may not always be there. It might be simpler to move to a front end MX, but we can't do that sort of yeah. thing with the current sub current mail systems we support. So I'd like to have some discussion today or later by email, whatever, I about how much people rely on this. Could we move that information into LDAP? Could we do something else for you? I don't know. Just I'd like to put that in people's mind. So uh, just a, a wish list feature request from me. I would like to make it so that external boxes, i.e. boxes that aren't .debian.org, cannot send mail to dsilvers at debian.org because the only people that should be are, to be frank, FTP master. Um, and I probably, I'd say about 25% of the spam that I receive has come through Debian machines. Can you open an RT ticket? <laughs> <laughs> so, actu actually, you have spoken a lot of, uh, how should I say, the mailing services on Debian org machines. Uh, I would really think it's, if you say it's too much, or it could be too much work, then just say which services it are, tell users, okay, we will continue to provide that service for the next one year or whatever, and after that, uh, be prepared to lose it. This Kum this Kumail stuff was already deprecated when I joined Debian, which is this is also a few years ago now. <laughs> so I really think we can just shut it off with an appropriate warning period. Same goes for a lot of other issues. You would think that. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> Wait, what, what's warning otherwise? Well, who needs it? Some build team maintainers are currently using it. And about half the services that actually do whatever dot Debian dot org mail use them. Yeah. So it's a social engineering problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so yes. for the services it should be easy. Because you can, you can just say, well, we're going to fix it slowly. I, I know that you have a very good record of slowly fixing things, but then really, really doing it right. So that could be done with the services at least. And then there are only a few people left for it. That's, um, I think MIA makes heavy use of this feature and that MIA is not us. Yeah, so, not. you know. Also for mail setup and spam going in, like FTP master box, which is one which was heavily spammed in the past, in the last month got about only 5% of spam coming through. So that uh, setup is, <laughs> A really big advantage uh, over the, what we had in the past. We can set up mostly everything we want to have there. Yeah. And the only wish uh, one has when going through the mail setup is making it easier with the RBL list, which should not be as uh, split as it currently is. I have to set every RBL on my own. Every Debian developer can do that. It should basically be a checkbox, yes or no. Yeah. Some this, is, this is something I'd actually like to bring up. Um, we right now we every time we turn on some spam filtering feature, you know, RBLs or reverse DNS checks or or clam AV or whatever, um, somebody complains that we've eaten a mail that was spam that he really wanted. So we turn on some way in UDL app for you to say yes, no, maybe so, but only with these RPLs and so on. Is that actually, that's an, I mean, you know, this room of 30, 40 people isn't going to give me a definitive answer if that's a useful thing, but I'd like to, I don't think it's actually a very useful or a very scalable way to maintain our anti-spam infrastructure. Um, we have several dozen people who have RBLs listed in LDAP that we do queries against every time they get an email that have gone away several years ago. I, when I notice this, I try to remove them from LDAP manually, but this sort of thing doesn't scale very well, and I'd prefer to go to a sort of, yes, I'd like Debian to, to scan my mail, no, I wouldn't. Yes, I'd like RBLs, no, I wouldn't. I'd like to simplify it, but 
again, this is probably something people feel strongly about. So the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing that I feel strongly about is that you guys ought to be able to make those sorts of decisions and to constrain the amount of labor that DSA has to put into things that you think are of marginal utility. You know, part of this, I think, we get wound around the axle sometimes over the notion that, you know, part of being a Debian developer is you get a Debian.org email address that works, and I think somehow people translate that from, um, you know, a useful additional identity on their list of <coughs> email identities to somehow being the thing that matters to them the most in the world. and. You know, frankly, at the end of the day, if it's directly related to their you know, process of, of doing work in Debian, um, that they're asking for some specific feature, I think that that's something we ought to give you know fair and open hearing to, and, and consider whether you know there's a, a good or better way to accomplish that particular need. But um, I personally have very little tolerance for the notion that people are sort of pushing their you know sort of personal life needs into, you know, this expectation that somehow Debian and its volunteer administration team, you know, is somehow responsible for making their lives work perfectly. Um, I, I realize I'm something of an exception in the world because I have never used my Debian.org email address in the maintainer field of any of my packages and things like this. Uh, so I'm probably about as far at the other end of the continuum of concern about some of these issues as anyone could be. But um, I certainly would encourage you guys to look at things like this. There's clearly a distinction between exi existing cruft in the system that can sort of stay there statically and doesn't really make more work for you, mm -hmm. and things that actually cause you to have to do more work on a regular basis. And I think that latter category you know, if nothing else, maybe this is where you identify a list of potential projects that you would encourage other people to work on, maybe as a, a way of, you know, working their way into being, being able to help your team, you know, on a longer term basis. Um, you know, the QMail format dependency stuff, here's an example where, you know, maybe putting out a call for volunteers to investigate whether there is a different better, more maintainable way to accomplish the same functionality for the future would be a, a worthwhile project to identify. Um, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you guys go you know, do all of this work on. So I, I would encourage you to think in that sort of way and to not be afraid to tell us when something is just too much of a pain in the ass for volunteer admins to have to deal with. And uh, you know, if some polite peer pressure within the project would help you know, various folks to decide that yes, now's a good time for us to you know, figure out a different way to work personally, then I'm certainly happy to help with that. Um, maybe you have seen the recent mails Peter sent to Debian Project with the open task lists, what we are currently working on. Um, maybe if, if someone finds the time to say, okay, I would like to help here. Just pick one of the items on these task lists that would really, really be appreciated by the current DSA team. Small comment answer to your spam filtering question. I just, I don't think you need to be that fine grade as you have done uh, currently. I would le like to have three options. Yes, I trust Debian to throw away my spam, and yes, I trust Debian to flag my spam, and I don't want Debian to touch my email at all. If I have those three, I'll go with the flagging one, and I expect someone will be going with the throw away one, and I expect someone to don't want to have any filtering at all. Uh, I don't really care about the details. If you do flagging, just do whatever you want and flag it. Uh, if you want to reject emails, I think that's a better way to do it than to accept it and throw it away. So if you can get rid of spam by not accepting it at all, I'm fine with it. But if you actually accept it, then you should send it to me. Yeah. Yeah. What we, what we also have quite a lot is that the Debian mail servers are accept, uh, accepting emails for various persons in the project and then forwarding it to their um, private mail account, account and that machine then rejecting email from the from master debian org which is which 
makes the cues quite you. Well, one thing that could help is that, of course, is one thing is to tell all Debian developers to just whitelist all Debian org machines. <laughs> I know it, it's... We it doesn't already it, tried that. Yes, it, it, I know that, that, that most did it, but there are still some left who have uh, issues with whitelisting email. Um, and the other thing is it might be helpful to have a common SSL key on all the mail servers that are used outgoing. Well, not common, but from a common authority, so that I can say, well, I trust this authority to send only good mails. We currently have two different authorities, not all mail servers use their key really on outgoing mails, depending on which one we are. Or we could move to a hub structure for email and have only one or two outgoing mail servers. That's what, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we discussed recently in the latest DSA meeting. which requires quite a lot of restructuring of all the email. However, if we move to that, will I receive an email every time I bounce a bit of spam saying I've bounced one out of 270 messages? Um, that's a list master setting. That's not the thing uh, DSA, ha what, uh, it's not DSA duties, it's uh, on the list master's duty. Um, it's just a warning that you might get kicked off the list uh, if you uh, bounce more spam back to list Debian org. Don't bounce back to list. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Vito. The microphone to me, thanks. So uh, it, 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 so sorry, it's, it seems quite surprising, but some of us might be in a situation where our primary mail host is one that we can't, um, for example, stop it from doing a head of validity checks on mails coming from this Debian org uh, because it's part of the, the general system setup or we're not necessarily in control of it. So we, we have, I, I personally have a lot of, had a lot of difficulty with Debian lists that they weren't, for a while, I don't know if they now are, they weren't doing syntax checking on incoming headers on mails. Um, they weren't doing send a call out verify, which meant that lists then tried to pass a mail on to the server that was receiving my mail, and my, my server went, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to think about sending you a 354, give me some content. I, well, I, I think there's some overlap between the teams and... Um this is an interesting conversation. It's not precisely DSA's problem. So I'm going to say, can we have a chat after? But actually, I think still in the DSA corners is to say, please do not, even if you notice something that is spam what you get from Debian or host, you don't make it better by the checks list of Debian or host back under no circumstances. Um, about forwarding, I mean, uh, I understand how email works and about queuing and all of that, but why couldn't we, uh, since we're not hosting mail, are we? No, we are not. Are uh, there some people that receive We are for four people. Okay, okay, so, so we aren't, um, or we, we maybe shouldn't be, we maybe should be a forwarding only provider, and then, could, I don't know if XM supports that, but why couldn't the mail be forwarded and the connection to the sending host kept open, if there was a rejection, then you reject the mail um, on the on this receiving side of the Debian machine. I'm not sure I'm expressing myself clearly, but... I, I know what you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure if Exum supports it without a little hacking around, but um, there's also, there are time limits on these sorts of things, and I don't yeah, and multiple recipients, and it's kind of a mess. So I'd like to not go that way. Okay, as n a non-Debian mail user, um, this is striking me greatly as it's time for a policy document on what you want to do, put it out to everybody, and for God's sake, just do it. Um, there's one...
one small suggestion from the University of Oslo where uh, they have a mechanism I haven't seen anyone else been using uh, for rejecting emails. Uh, it's basically the connecting side will not get a reply within a few seconds. The specifications say you have to wait for the hello message. If you don't, they disconnect. Uh, every time the res uh, descending part uh, do a typo in the communication protocol, uh, the, there is a time delay. And the time delay is uh, doubled every time there is a typo in the communication. And this actually got rid of 90% of all spam delivered to the University of Oslo. Yet all well-behaving um, mail uh, servers will get their emails delivered properly. Yeah, what you're talking about is something like tier grouping based on some variety of checks. Um, we already do quite a lot of these checks, uh, particularly for master. Tier grouping doesn't make sense because there's a lot more bad guys than there are masters. Um, master normally, at any given moment, has about 100 open SMTP connections, and we don't do any delaying at all right now. So if we added delays, master would conceivably have several thousand open SMTP connections all the time, which, you know, the botnet wins, unfortunately. Um, at the moment, we did some rough mail statistics the other day across Debian Org. We do, I just did the last 10 days of mail logs, and it was, we accepted a million and a half mails and forwarded on two and a half million emails, something like that, um, rejected about four million emails across all the machines and temp failed. I can't remember what it was, another three, another three four million. Um, those statistics are really, really skewed because things like the build Ds never actually re reject any mail. They don't do any mail to speak of. But something like Master Debian Org will do 30, 40,000 legitimate, well, by legitimate, I mean accepted emails a day and reject a million and a half mails. It's, you know, it's master is pretty much running flat out saying no thank you. I suspect your assumption is incorrect. Uh, I don't think the number of connections will increase because most spammers actually disconnect uh, after three seconds because they don't have time to wait for a long connection to, f to finish the conversation. Let's, we can carry this on later. I don't know, you know, if we need to talk about exact specifics right now, but it's an interesting conversation, so please, let's have it. I have a, sorry, I have a little problem with uh, the mail I received from the list because I am receiving on my Debian org address and from time to time, I receive uh, an email from the list server saying uh, we have received bounces from you. Uh, apparently, there is some kind of content filtering at master, right? Um, uh, is there a way to opt out from such uh, content filtering yeah. on a per user basis? What we well, have a couple things well, I'd like to say here. The first is we're not an ISP. If, if you want to receive mailing sorry, list mail... I would like to uh, add something. Oh, okay, uh, sorry, go ahead. I, I think you should maybe uh, coordinate with the list master team so that uh, this kind of things do I'm not I'm happen. one member of the list master team as well. Okay. Um, what we are currently doing is we are getting all the uh, forward uh, addresses that are set in UDLDAP um, to be exported to the list server and not, di uh, not mailing the... Uh, mails back to master and then to the uh, actual recipient, but instead um, mapping all the, all your Debian org accounts to the, your real forwarding account and sending the mail from list Debian org directly to your forwarded account. Aha, so you, the solution would be not to uh, make my mail to pass master? It doesn't. Not to receive the mail on master. That would no, be your mail solution. doesn't. Uh, if you get a mail from from list, it won't ever get to master, but directly to you at the moment. Well, it will if his forwarding address is username at master because he insists on yes. doing proc mail on master. 
Um, I'm using Procmail yeah. Master. Okay. Exactly. And so maybe the answer is for either lists to not actually forward the spam, which we can easily filter out on master, so lists could do it as, do as well. The other answer is don't do Procmail Master, please. Just get your email directly sent from lists. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's, I, I appreciate that people have complicated mail setups that have taken them 20 years to perfect. But it, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're not an ISP, and I make no guarantee about not, un, not getting you unsubscribed from a mailing list. My primary motivation is to keep the load on master below 50, you know. So, apart from email, we are, <laughs> and e email is a huge part of we, what we are doing, or what Steven is doing. Uh, we are still providing lots of things for various teams. Uh, how do people, or would it be easier for, or would people prefer to have it easier to get services provided by us? Currently, what people do is they send an email, please can we have, and we say yes, but or maybe no. several people aren't aware of that. Should we do any kind of thing to make setting up new whatever.debian.org web services easier? What would people like there? Well, I'm not answering your question, I have another question. Uh, what's the status of snapshots.debian.org? Uh, waiting for one machine to get shipped to an uh, institute in the UK and after that probably having... Well, uh, I have whatever, or the code I currently have is running on stabilet.debian.org and every Devon developer has an account there, so you can actually go and look what's there. Right now the only means to access the snapshot stuff is through a Fuse file system, so you can just CD into stuff and see whatever's there. There currently is no web interface to it, but maybe we have time to write one here at DevConf, otherwise at some other point. Uh, there is no particular issue, it's just that there isn't one yet. And we need to import some data from Snapshot DBNet as soon yeah, as we uh, receive that data? Currently, the Snapshot on Stabula has all of uh, the Debian archive Debian Security, Debian Volatile, Backports Org, and Debian Archive since January this year. It would be really, really nice to import all the data from snapshots Debian.net, which I think is from 04 until at some point last year. But I've sent several mails to the snapshot Debian.net person and never got a reply. So if somebody knows him, please give him a prod so we can get the data. How can you import stuff that is no longer on FTP Master from FTP Master? Um, <laughs> in the more queue? Well, we can get the packages. We can't know when they were added and we stuff. We can because we have the database snapshots. We don't. We do expire database snapshots. We cannot get everything back from FTP Master. We do have the source going back to till 2000 or something, but we will have a problem getting it into the right date and suite and whatever. And importing old packages is somewhere on the list as soon as FTP master sets up morg.debinorg. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the of your host while it's currently running? Stabile. One issue that I found is um, when I'm trying to work on a particular porter problem, it takes a while for the build dependencies to get installed on the porter boxes. Is there any way that, that the speed of that could be increased or maintainers could possibly install mm -hmm. or install the build dependencies themselves or something like that? Well, actually, usually it takes less than 24 hours to get the uh, build dependencies installed. There were some talks within the uh, DSA team on getting the porters also do, uh, doing that work. Yeah, um, unfortunately for me, 24 hours later, I'm, yeah, I'm in a meeting or I'm, I'm doing something else, um, which, which is the, the, the issue. Um, it's, it's certainly not 
trying to portion any blame onto DSA or, or anyone for this. It just may be a useful service if this can be resolved yeah, so it could be streamlined. It might, it might be useful to give everybody pseudo for apt in the true root. I don't, I'd have to think about the implications of that. Yeah, maybe only install. So indeed I was, maybe you have already thought about some security reason which inhibit that, but maybe is it, would it possible to have something like cow builder or something as such? Maybe just building DSC, maybe not logging in or anything like that? Yeah, that might be. I, we'll have to come, let's come have a chat and see if we can come up with anything that's wrong with it. But in, in principle, something like that seems, something like that. Uh, I'm not really sure I like the security properties of that because you basically get root on the machine. And I can't think of any way to make it less, to make it have less impact. We've had other discussions in the past, though, about the possibility of doing something like um, uh, developer-initiated um, package builds through the auto-building system and things like this, where, <clears throat> you know, if you're working on a porting problem, being able to have an interface that says, I'd like this DSC and the associated stuff to be sent to this architecture's auto-builder stuff and send the results back to me instead of the normal <coughs> auto-builder maintainer, since... I don't want to bother him, but I just need some auto builder to try building this in the normal build environment and let me see what happens and get the log and so what? forth. You know, ideally, you'd like to get back the, you know, the, the, the live you know, build tree so that you can go triage temp files and all those sorts of things. But even just being able to get the verbose log back from an auto builder directly without bothering the buildy admin would be a really interesting what way to think about finessing this. What we discussed recently um, is that we might be setting up some, some sort of batch server you can upload a um, package to and then it starts building up the whole archive based on that library. Um, we've, we've got the uh, machine, or I think we have enough power on the machines to do uh, on one of the... Well, we have enough CPU, we don't have enough power to yes. power the CPU. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, different question. Earlier you mentioned you've got 30 different sites. Have 34, you got 35. 34. Have you got any plans to consolidate? Because that sounds yes, one or two too many. No, well, actually, um, there are too many, but we, we also want to have them dis a little bit distributed. So if one data center gets switched off at one day, not all of the Debian infrastructure is down. Yes, so maybe three locations would be perfect, <laughs> but 35 certainly is way too much. If anybody wants to host a couple racks of Debian machines, come find us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to... <laughs> yes, we do need power and network, please. So, to answer your uh, question, um, uh, Peter, um, I think that maybe a mail to Debian developments even maybe um, periodically sending mails, like bits from the DSA team, send it, saying um, we have those new services, we made those changes, and uh, if you want anything new, please contact us, and we're here, stuff like that. We're doing I mean, that to Debian project at the moment, which seems to be more appropriate address for that, at, at least from my point of view. Yeah. I, I really like that. I already said that, but it was more of an internal work list. I'd, I'd like something like of an uh, announcement of uh, changes if, that were If made. you want to make the internal work list into a proper announcement email, please do. <laughs> this whole communication thing is kind of new for DSA, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you can simply add a few lines into the developer news wiki. Everybody can edit it and uh, just put the link uh, to the Debian project mail. I think it's enough. And uh, well, yeah. I also want to use the opportunity to really thank you because well, I've been following what you did since uh, well, since when uh, Elmo added me to the request tracker, and you have done an awesome job over the the years. And uh, really, uh, big kudos to you. Thank you. Uh, Also, as for communications channels, 
Sobel recently set up a DSA blog, which currently I think has one or even two items. Uh, <laughs> and it's basically just a short notice that we are working on stuff. One of them is the geodomains setup, and what was the other one? Was there another one? Yes. Ah, no, uh, dub has geodns. Yes. Yeah. And it's even syndicated to Planet Debian, or so you probably all read it anyway. Yeah, we, we will do. Um, what we also were discussing on how to get new members in, into the teams. Uh, in, into our team. It's quite hard because you need to, uh, as soon as uh, the person is real DSA member, he has root, on all, uh, root access on all machines. So um, f getting new team members is also some way of trusting w with, within Debian. Um, there is no real trainee process for that. So you either need to trust or you can't. Maybe. Maybe if anybody has any good sysadmin mentoring <laughs> programs that you're working with that work really well for you, come have a chat. Because it's very difficult to go from accepting patches for the Apache config to giving pseudo on 90 machines. And I, I have a little mental block on how to do it in a good way. One thing we did at the University of Tromsø was to provide a uh, basically a menu for junior admins to run uh, specific sudo commands. They would be able to list and kill the user processes. Uh, they would be able to fix print queues, that kind of thing. Like day-to-day -day work, where they only could do those things we had specified in the yeah. menu and in the sudo file. Yeah. But still, they were able to prove themselves uh, that way. Uh, that was not really my main question. Uh, we use uh, RT at the University of Oslo quite a lot, and we have extended it to accept uh, m commands in the emails, so we can actually uh, handle all the uh, requests by email. Have you considered, or do you plan to uh, we are do the same for doing the that? As mm, no, we yeah. aren't really. But if you could send us a patch, please do. Mm -hmm. oh, you don't or need a patch. or help a us setting it up. It's our RT uh, module from uh, Best Practical. Actually, we paid them to take our packet and make it an official one. Uh, so it's an official mo extension to RT. And it's using, uh, accepting commands as signed email, or how does it work? Uh, you put the command as the first section with, uh, well, command colon value, and then you can do a status colon resolve, for example. Is there any is kind of authentication? Mm -hmm. You can do authentication if you want. We have never had people that actually wanted to do uh, ticket handling on their own without authorization at the university. And we have 5,000 uh, employees and 20,000 users, uh, students. Uh, so I don't think that's a real problem. But you can uh, flag, uh, uh, configure RT to only accept it for GPG signed uh, emails, for example. Uh, I think that's a waste of time, personally. But uh, if you really, really want that, sure, go ahead. What, what we have also established recently is that some certain groups may, for example, restart Apache with their new configuration. So we are just checking if, uh, for the, that the Apache config is, is valid and has some uh, certain, um, no, for example, that it doesn't uh, start a new virtual host and so on. Uh, for this build dependency problem that uh, was brought up earlier. Um, I think uh, 24 hours is a uh, honorable uh, amount of time to install build dependencies, and I appreciate all the build D maintainers who have managed to get that kind of turnaround. But uh, I do understand the uh, when you're sitting down to work on a problem and then you have to stop because you don't have a package installed is very frustrating. Um, so have there have been any thoughts uh, to something like mm -hmm. a developer-initiated temporary time-delimited virtual environment that um, someone could have? Do you know of any good virtualization things that work on all of our architectures? Uh, what are your criteria for the word good? <laughs> <laughs> Having access 
to it, root in it, does not mean having root on the system itself. Oh, but isn't that the case for most of the containerized virtualized environments? If you think change root is a virtualization, then no. Otherwise, then maybe. But I'm not aware of anything that works across of all of our architectures except to change roots. Yeah, I guess the Linux v server project is the only one that mm. does in most architectures. Which one? The Linux v server project. So also, more what? Than yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's building on. It's probably we don't have the disk space on all of our porting machines. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's pretty small to get a, a minimal root installed we, with the Linux we, server. We, pro we are running out of space with the existing change routes as soon as people don't delete their uh, GCC build. Yeah, that's why I was saying time Could dependent, like four days and then it gets deleted automatically or something. Anyway. Maybe. Yeah. To, to just go back slightly uh, further, because time warps are fun, um, you said on one of your slides that Puppet wasn't really doing it for you. That it was functioning, but that you, you you perhaps felt slightly dirty every time you had to touch it. Yes. As a result, do you actually have a functional spec that someone could take out and go and evaluate other things for you to perhaps find something else for you to use? Um, pretty nearly, yeah. Um, conditional inclusion of various categories of configuration management depending on some host-specific data and templating of files that need to be on every machine but must be different depending on host-dependent data. <coughs> That's real, and the ability to run a post hook command if a file is updated. Like That's really all we need. Isn't that what uh, Puppet does? That's exactly what Puppet does. It just doesn't do it that well. <laughs> I just wanted to add to the build dependency issue that I think uh, 24 hours, it's quite good, and I think it's only solvable it if there is some automated way, because um, there will never be a turnaround time, uh, turnaround time that is really useful for people currently working on a only problem you, and needing you're, it only if you're in, at this time. You're and absolutely right. This is something that I've been thinking about, frankly, for a very long time. I helped us set up, I guess it was the auto building stuff for either the second or the third architecture that we added support for after MCK. And the challenge has always been that trying to apply technological solutions like uh, user initiated, you know, virtualized clients and so forth is generally only possible on the architectures for which we need it the least. Um, architectures that have broad support for these sorts of new technologies are also the architectures for which many of us have access to a physical machine. And the challenge has always been how do you chase down a porting problem on that machine that's sort of in the margins of you know whether it should still be part of our stable release process <laughs> or not. <coughs> and in those sorts of situations, um, this is this is why I've personally been driven over time, as I mentioned earlier, to think more in terms of how can we do something like a developer-initiated um, package passing through our auto-building system, which is something that we already have, you know, sort of a project dependency on. It's something that DSA and the the porting team already has to to sort of take care of and maintain. Um, the 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 hack, if you will, of having you know, sort of physical machines of a given architecture available for developers to log into and try and do interactive work on, um, I, you know, <clears throat> there are certainly cases for which that's the only way to solve the problem. And in those sorts of cases, I would agree that I think if the admin team is capable to me of meeting routinely a 24-hour response time for helping to get the right environment set up to do those sorts of weird, you know, last ditch effort kinds of activities, that's great. But, <clears throat> you know, it, I, I, on the other side, for the sort of more routine trying to track problems down thing, uh, 24 hours is utterly unacceptable because very few of us have, you know, bursts of availability that are, you know, that predictable in advance. And if you ask for something and then you have to wait a day or something before you can sort of take any further action, chances are good that you're off on you're off on some entirely different problem, you know, perhaps one that your wife suggested was more important. So um, this, is, this is why I think there has to be a balance, and I think it would be very interesting to, to pursue the notion of, of other paths through the auto-building thing as a way to get around.
Yeah, but right. I, I think there should also, or there could be a way to do it securely, um, to have some script that runs as on the sudo, which is very limited. You can only specify packages from trusted archives, which it should install in, into some specified can, can change route or something like that. Can we like discuss that, that after the talk? We are yeah. a little bit running out of time. I just want to make one final remark on contacting us. There are two lists um, where the Debian admin team is uh, having sent mail to. Um, and there's al always a bit confusing on um, where to send what email. Um, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> the Debian admin at listdebian.org is uh, including also all the local admins, which are porters at some time. Uh, or some of them are porters. So if you need a package installed on one of the built uh, on one of the uh, porter machines, send your mail there. If you, the only reason to contact uh, DSA via Debian admin at debian.org is if you have confidential data, which should only send to a very closed group. Um, other than that, just send it to Debian admin at list debian.org. There's, a, I think, some 18 or 20 persons on that list, um, which is much more than just the. Uh, DSA team. And there is uh, the hash Debian admin on IRC. Um, if you want to contact us, do it there. Hmm? Yes, um, just don't stay around in that IRC channel because if it's getting too crowded, then uh, we can't discuss um, D uh, DSA internal um, matters on that IRC channel. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for being a friendly audience. Um, <laughs> and thank you for your suggestions. We're, we're here all week. Uh, let's have a chat if you have something you want to talk about. <laughs>